Okay, I hope you can see my scene, uh, screen. Is everything okay? Right. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm speaking from uh, Japan. And uh, as you can see, I'm at home here. I'm doing my social distancing, as everybody's expected to. Um, I am using two monitors. So if sometimes I look to the left and look to the right, I'm not ignoring you. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and start. So uh, thank you very much, eFuture, for um, hosting this and giving me the opportunity to talk about extensive reading. Uh, you can see from the first slide that I am uh, also representing the Extensive Reading Foundation. The Extensive Reading Foundation is an international organization, not for profit, that uh, is promoting extensive reading. So please, um, uh, please go and have a look at uh, that, um, that page. And I'll just put that link for you into the chat window. So um, I'm going to be talking about extensive reading and I'm sure some of you have heard about extensive reading. And uh, so I'm going to start off and show you the menu. Today's menu will be uh, the modern definition of extensive reading. What is it? What is it not? Uh, the reasons why reading fluency is important. How does extensive reading, this is ER, how does ER fit the curriculum and how do we set up an ER class? So we will go through these in session. So let's start off with defining extensive reading. What is it and what is it not? So here's the questions for you. Uh, you don't need to answer in the chat window. Um, that will just probably take too long. Just in your mind, just think, uh, which materials would we use for extensive reading? And those of us who looked at Alana's presentation last time, which is on the eFuture uh, YouTube channel, will know, of course, that for extensive reading, we would use storybooks. Uh, these are books which could be uh, fiction or non-fiction, and they are specifically written for extensive reading. Uh, textbooks with exercises, this type of thing, is a very good way to do reading, but it's a different type of reading from extensive reading. Should the reading be easy or a little difficult? Well, I think most of you should know that the reading would be easy. It should be easy. It should be inside the student's uh, reading, fluent reading ability. And if it's very difficult, like this text on the right, uh, I borrowed this from uh, a medical uh, online journal, and I have no idea what some of these words mean. Napsaline, I don't know. Desaturatide, I don't know. So it should be easy. We should also decide if we, the students should be reading slowly and carefully or fast and enjoyably. And of course, the answer is they should be reading fast and enjoyably. Uh, don't you just love this image? I think it's great. Okay, so fast and enjoyably, it should be fun. Should be able to use a dictionary when doing extensive reading. Now, some people would say you should never use a dictionary when doing extensive reading. But my view is that sometimes there's going to be words you don't know. So a dictionary sometimes is okay, but it should not be used all the time. For intensive reading, which we will talk about later, then uh, we can use a dictionary, that's fine. So there's no, it's not necessary to use a dictionary. Uh, the problem with using a dictionary is if you're reading something that's too difficult, the students will be having to stop, look in the dictionary, go back, stop, look in the dictionary, go back. And that's not fluent reading. So dictionary sometimes is okay. Should the students be studying the vocabulary and grammar when they read extensively or reading for fun? Well, they should be reading, of course, as reading practice. The reading practice, uh, you can see a difference between the pictures on the left and the picture on the right. On the picture on the left, you can see that there is a pen. If the students are using a pen, they're probably doing study reading, study reading. There's nothing wrong with study reading. But study reading is something we do to build the language knowledge. Extensive reading is about building the practice, reading speed and fluency. This is something we'll come back to later. So we have to understand this difference between the two main kinds of reading. One type of reading, which is typically using textbooks, 
is called study reading or intensive reading. And you can see in the pictures here, we have a class of all of the students doing exactly the same thing, probably reading aloud. We have a student here, and maybe you can see or can't quite see, there's a pen in his hand, there's a pen in her hand, and this child here is struggling with the reading. So in intensive reading, we tend to use textbooks. Usually there's lots of comprehension questions, vocabulary activities, and so on. And this is a great thing to do because it builds reading knowledge. On the right, we have reading practice, which is our extensive reading, where here you see the students are not holding a pen. The students are just reading. They don't need a dictionary because the reading is easy, it's fast, it's fluent, and it's enjoyable. So we have two different ways of thinking about reading. In a similar way, we can look at the details here of what's happening. So in the intensive reading study, students are le learning to read. In extensive reading, they are reading to learn. So the focus here is on the topic. What is the story about? What's the information they're about? And here, the focus is on the language, building language skills and language knowledge. So the materials that are typically used for intensive reading would be textbooks, worksheets, tests. Often, the whole class are using the same material. Um, we're working on phonics, maybe the alphabet, vocab building. We're focusing on new words and grammar, reading skills, text structure, and so on. All of these things are part of a typical reading class, and they're all great things to do, but they don't build reading fluency, and we'll look at that later. For reading uh, extensively, for reading practice, students would be reading graded readers. They would be... Uh, if you want to find out about graded readers, please look at Alana's presentation uh, from last month. The students choose their own books. They decide what they want to read at their own reading speed and something that they enjoy. The focus is not on the language, but on fluency and reading speed. There's an assumption in reading practice and extensive reading that the students already know quite a lot of the words on the page. If they know the words on the page already, or most of the words on the page, they can read quickly. If there are too many words they don't know, they read slowly, and therefore the reading goes back towards intensive reading. So we'll look at this in detail a little bit later. The focus here is on comprehension and natural reading practice at their level. Even students who are elementary can still read some easy books smoothly, and fluently. They can't read more difficult books smoothly and fluently, of course, but they can read easy books at their level, and we'll talk about level later. So this is similar in a way to the difference between learning to drive and being able to just drive naturally on the street. Re extensive reading is enjoying the drive and skilled reading, just having some fun. Learning to drive, you go to driving school where you're learning the mechanics of how to drive, how to move the car. This is a very similar an analogy. Similarly with learning the piano. When you're learning the piano, you have a piano teacher. You maybe have uh, somebody watching you, showing you how to move your fingers, how to master the system, how to master the rules, memorizing some songs, memorizing your finger position, and so on. This is learning how to play the piano. On the right side is practicing the skill, playing your music, getting better at it, improving your speed, improving your fluency, and so on. And they're two different things. Reading uh, can be split in the same way. So what is extensive reading? When we talk about extensive reading, we typically talk about it from a teacher's point of view. These are the activities that teachers do to help students read faster and more naturally. Things like set up a library or manage the library, organize the reading, make sure the students are reading at the right level, doing follow-up activities like speaking activities or checking their reading reports, uh, making sure the students are um, giving presentations or making PowerPoints or something about their reading. So doing the follow-up activities. 
So extensive reading involves, from a teacher's point of view, everything from creating the library, organizing the library, getting students to know what to read, making sure they read, and following up the reading with uh, activities. When we read extensively, this is something that a student would be doing. So students would read extensively. They're reading smoothly, quickly, and with high comprehension. So I want you for a moment just to try and read this. And as you read this, think about what's happening in your head. I'll give you about one minute to read this. Please read this. Thank you. If you haven't finished, it's okay. What you should be noticing as you were reading this is that the beginning part of this, this was relatively easy, yeah? And uh, it was, uh, most of the words at the beginning were quite, quite easy. But as you got down the text, there were maybe a few words that slowed you down. Perambulations, laminate, maybe you don't know bamboozled, maybe you don't know cuppa. So these are speed reading bumps. Some part of this text you can read smoothly and easily, and maybe some of these things are going to be a bit difficult. And this is how students typically read intensively, right? What they do is they read something, they can master some of the words, but they have to stop, maybe ask the teacher, maybe need to go into a dictionary. This is typical intensive reading, where you're not able to read smoothly, your eye is stopped, they're like speed reading bumps. When you're driving a car, there's a bump on the road, will slow you down. So intensive reading typically looks like this. There's a relationship between comprehension and speed. On the right side here, we can spe see speed, and on the left, we can see comprehension. If the reading is slow and intentional, where you have to have high effort, frequent loss of comprehension, and it's demotivating, where there's lots of things that you don't know. Then uh, the next type of reading is it's slow reading with some pauses, loss of comprehension, frequent dictionary use, but most of it you can understand. You can understand, but slowly. And that's a little bit like the passage that I just showed you. And comprehension's a bit higher, and your speed is a little bit higher. The next one is fast, fluent reading. With few pauses, you're not slowed down, there's high comprehension, high involvement in the story, and the students are just lost in the flow. They just read and continue reading and they forget about the time. So there's a difference between these. The first one we call reading pain. Reading pain. This is where often students will be demotivated, uh, they think it's too difficult, they give up reading, and they just think it's just too hard for them. Intensive reading or study reading is this middle one. Often this will be where, like the previous passage, you had to stop, maybe look at a dictionary, your brain's not reading fluently, it's stopped from time to time. And extensive reading has got high speed and high comprehension, where, as I can see, as you can see here, she has a book in her hand, here there's a pen, and here she has a head in her hands. So what are the conditions that we need to create so students can read extensively? Well, first, students need to have a balanced curriculum. Before students can read extensively, they must know some of the language, of course. They need to know some words, they need to know some grammar, they need to know the alphabet, they need to know possibly some phonics. All of these things are pre-extensive reading. Pre-extensive reading, you have to build up that knowledge first. They have to meet a lot of language, but also, as they build their career, they need to meet words and phrases frequently. As we'll come to later, students don't remember words and phrases from one meeting. They take time to read. They need to meet words again and again and again so they stay in their head. We'll come back to that later. 
But students also need to build fluency or automaticity. They need to be able to read smoothly, uh, be able to process language quickly, because there's a change in the way that you, your brain processes language when you read quickly. And we'll talk about that later. So in order to do this, the reading should be structured. It should not be a random system of any word and any passage that builds on previous knowledge. So the students need to be able to build on previous knowledge without too much new language coming to them, because otherwise there will be uh, some potential problems for them uh, because the input would be random. So this is a question for you as a teacher, for you to find out whether you're reading, whether what you're doing in your reading class and what it is. If you're teaching phonics or the alphabet or maybe some vocabulary building from flashcards, um, if you're doing, uh, teaching them spelling, this is building the linguistic foundation. Maybe you're also helping them with some grammar. If you're using a textbook, a reading textbook, and you're doing reading skills, their exercises, all the students do the same thing together, this will be intensive reading language instruction. And all of this is great stuff to do. It's stuff we absolutely should be doing, but it's before they can start extensive reading. If you're doing extensive reading, then your role as a teacher is changing. Your role changes from not being so much of a teacher to more of a manager of the reading. So here you're managing the library of the materials, you're getting new books, you're making sure the students know where the books are, how to find them, how to borrow them. You're monitoring their reading to make sure they're reading at the right level, that they understand what's going on, that they're enjoying it. You're assigning some follow-up tasks, such as uh, talk about the books, write a report about the books, um, or maybe make a presentation, uh, that kind of thing. Or maybe as a teacher, you're just watching them read to make sure that they are reading in the right way and they're not diving into their dictionary too much. So as a teacher, your role will change. Your role will change from here to here to be an extensive reading teacher. So if you're doing these types of things, you're probably doing more intensive reading. As I say, nothing wrong with doing this, but do understand that your students will need to be moving here as well. If you only keep them going here, they will not be building their reading speed and reading fluency. So either you or somebody in your school should be helping them to do both this and this. Another way to look at this in terms of the balanced curriculum is we can divide language teaching into both listening and reading activities and speaking and writing activities. And we can have activities which are focused on language study and activities which are focused on language practice or communication. So learning stuff is the first part. Here, this is where you're getting input. You've got the textbooks, the dictionary, word learning, phonics, and grammar. So you're getting this from your books, getting this from your teacher. For this activity on the right, these are also study activities where you give them tests, they fill in the blanks, they maybe memorize a dialogue, and they have controlled language activities, right? All of these activities are about language study and language focus. Down the bottom here is where we have our extensive reading. This is, of course, reading and uh, listening. Here, of course, we have extensive reading, but also extensive listening. And everything I'm talking today about for extensive reading also applies for extensive listening. So here, the focus of these things, watching movies, podcasts, radio, watching TV, and so on, all of these are focused on understanding the content uh, fluently and quickly. And the focus is communicating. On the right side here is where the students have a chance to experiment with their language, where they can try out what they're doing, chatting with their friends, writing essays, doing a diary, giving presentations, making speeches. So we've got different activities, both listening and reading activities and speaking and writing activities. Now, this doesn't mean you as a teacher have to be doing everything and you split your time between these things. 
you, but somebody in your school needs to be doing these things. So you may be the expert here, that's fine, please continue doing that. You may be the expert in trying to help students write essays, that's fine. But the students in their career need to have a balance of all of these things. And extensive reading is often the missing part. We do a lot of this type of thing in our classes. We do a lot of this and we do a lot of this. But this is often the missing component and why it's so important that we talk about this and understand why it fits into the curriculum. So the top part here is about control tasks, controlled by the teacher or controlled by the textbook that you use. The bottom part are open-ended autonomous tasks to build autonomy, to build chances for the students to build reading speed, read what they like, enjoy what they like, and to fall in love with English and make them feel that English has a real reason rather than just studying a textbook and studying for tests. Here, students can feel they're actually experiencing something in English. And one of the great things about extensive reading from the research, uh, I checked the research some years ago, and um, of the 400 articles that I read about extensive reading, those which talked about motivation, there was not one single study that said motivation decreased if students were doing extensive reading. For difficult, intensive reading, yes, that can demotivate. But where students are reading at their level, then motivation, general motivation for English increases because they feel they're doing something more real with the language. So this is the same information in a different way. Using the textbook, great to do. Giving tests, great to do. Chatting and writing, great to do. But we need to have the storybooks, the graded readers down here as well. So this should be 25% of your curriculum should be each one of these things. I want to now talk a little bit about the reasons why we do extensive reading beyond what I've just described. And I want you to understand how a traditional syllabus is designed. Not all syllabuses are like this, but most syllabuses are like this. And it's important for you to understand this so that we can then talk about the place of extensive reading from a linguistic point of view. What does a typical syllabus look like? Well, it typically is broken into units of some kind, maybe units that you've created or maybe materials that a publisher has done for you in your textbook. So in the typical one that we would have at unit one, it might be the B verb, and unit one might teach some simple adjectives like, um, I am hot, she's tired, uh, they are lonely, da da da. Unit two would be, for example, simple present tense, and maybe some daily routines. I get up at seven o'clock, I go downstairs, I have my breakfast, I clean my teeth, I go to school, and so on and so on. Unit three would have, say, present continuous tense and sporting activities. Unit four would have maybe some modal verbs, can and can't, with some abilities. I can ride a horse, I can't speak English, um, I can uh, ride a motorbike, and so on and so on. So I want you to notice something about this design. My guess is that your syllabus looks something like this, either the one that you've created or the one given to you in the textbook you need to look at. It's important to understand what's happening here. Notice there's a linear structure here. Linear here means line. It goes from unit one to unit two, unit three. What's the key thing here? The key thing to notice is we have new grammar, new vocabulary, new grammar, new vocabulary, new grammar, new vocabulary. And the focus is on new, 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 all the way through. Now, some books and textbooks do have review units, uh, a little bit of recycling, but most of the work is new. I would say that most, most classes that teachers teach have something new for each class. This is typical in intensive reading. What's the theory behind this? The theory is that we've taught the B verb in unit one and we don't need to teach it again because typically the words and things that appear in this activity 
probably are not going to appear later. These words about sporting activities are not going to appear in Unit 8 about internet technology. So often, a lot of teaching we do is one-hit learning. The theory is, we've taught this, therefore the students have learned it, now we can move on. We don't need to go again. Or another way to think about this is teaching causes learning. Now, all of us know that with the structure, that it might not necessarily work very well. Why is this? And this is because the strongest finding in educational psychology tells us something very important. It tells us that if you teach something today, let's say you teach 20 new words or you teach a new grammar point, what's going to happen to that knowledge over time? Well, science tells us that if you teach 20 new words here, we know that if you test the students tomorrow, they're probably only going to remember 50% of those. If you don't teach it again and you test them, say, a week later, maybe they'll remember maybe five of those words. And this is what happens. This curve has a name. And if, you, if I ask you to remember one thing from today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. There is nothing, and I repeat this, nothing more important than understanding the implications of this, and it's called the forgetting curve. We know, you know, that students forget. Let me give you an example. Can you remember the names of all of your students from two years ago? Can you remember what you were doing on July the 7th at, uh, last year? Can you remember what you had for breakfast three days ago? Well, it's very difficult for you to remember, right? And the reason is all of us, all of us forget. But the problem is that the syllabuses we often create assume forgetting does not happen. But it will happen. Now, you may remember some information, but you're going to forget a lot of this. This is really important. If as a teacher, you're focused every class on new, 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 then by the end of the semester, you can guarantee that students will forget. We know this. We all know this. So we uh, have to remember that we need to fight this forgetting curve at all times. And the way we do this is making sure that the forgetting that does happen comes back again soon. We review it. But even the second time, we're going to forget again. So we need to review it again. They're going to forget again. So we need to review it again. And it's very important that we build this recycling into our curricula. It's crucial that we do. Otherwise, students will use it and lose it. So we don't want them to lose it. We want them to remember. So the structure of our courses has to build in this recycling of knowledge, the recycling of vocabulary. So what have we covered so far? The points we've covered so far are that um, using textbooks and worksheets, etc., help, they do the initial start of teaching. Hello, this is the vocabulary, this is the grammar, let's work, let, let me just understand the rule, but we need to strengthen that practice through uh, to, so they can retain and strengthen and deepen that knowledge. We need to have this initial teaching through the intensive work and the extensive reading, the extensive practice to retain and strengthen that knowledge. So then the question is, what's the optimum time? What time is best to review before we forget? How soon do we need to recycle this knowledge? Is it one day, two days, five days, a month? How long do we wait? Well, to answer this, we need to understand something about how frequently words appear in text. Now, I'm going to show you an image on the next screen. Please don't panic when you see, at it, when you see it. If you only want to remember one thing, just read the red. Okay? So, some words are more, much more useful than others. A small number of words cover a large percentage of any text. So, this is the detail. If we... If we look at a computer, 
and we throw the words from reading materials into a computer. We can analyze it and try and find out how many words uh, appear and which words and how frequent. We know, research tells us, that some words are very highly frequent and some words have low frequency. They don't appear very often. These words appear every day, all the time. These words you meet every two or three days. These words maybe once a week or once a month. And these ones once or twice a year. We do know, and probably most of you know, that the word the, the article the, covers 6% of any text. One word in 18 in any text you pick up is the word the. The second most frequent word would be be, and then we have and and so on. Now we do know that only 25 different words, and these are mostly function words like the prepositions, the articles, and so on, they cover 50% of the volume of any text. These are so important, these words. We know that a thousand different words cover 80 to 82% of any text. So if you know a thousand words, you can pick up any text in English and you will know 80 to 82% of these words. We know that 3,000 different words will cover 85 to 90% of any native text. What that saying is, these are really important, and we need to meet these words again and again and again and again to strengthen them. When these words are learned, we move on to the next ones and the next ones and next ones. We also need to understand that in most textbooks and most reading materials, 40% of words appear only one or two times per text. We can almost guarantee that these words will be forgotten. So we need to make sure that we understand these principles here. So what's the implication of word frequency? Well, the student should learn the frequent and useful words first. That's clear and that's obvious. And this is often done because um, the textbook writers are very careful about the words that they put into textbooks. And people who write graded readers carefully put these words at the right time for learning. The words need to be met again soon, and regularly, so memories are strengthened. We need to strengthen these memories before the forgetting curve kicks in. So we now know that the students need to be mastering words by meeting them again and again and again. And your textbook will not be enough because typically in a textbook, words that are taught in the textbook only appear one, two, three times. But we do know that to master a word, it takes between 10 to 15 times before the student's going to learn it. If your textbook only shows the word two or three times, and you maybe talk about it one or two more times in class, that's not going to be enough for long-term acquisition. There'll be a lot of forgetting. So the role of extensive reading is that these words will appear from the textbook in the graded readers and will be recycled and be met many, 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 many times. So the next question is, how many words do students need to meet to, I beg your pardon, not master, to meter, but master, say, 4,000 words? Why 4,000? 4,000 would be an advanced level. A pretty much an advanced level student would know 4,000 different words. Now, maybe in your class, you only need to take them to the elementary level or to the intermediate level. But overall, through their career, to be independent of teachers, to be independent of textbooks, you need about 4,000 words to, to function independently. Well, you need to maybe not study English anymore. You just use it. So how much language do you need to meet to do that? Well, if we know something about this, the frequency, we can then do calculations. For students to get to the elementary level, they need to read about or meet about 150,000 words. If we want students to become intermediate level, they need to read about or meet about 300,000 words. Upper intermediate, 700,000 words, and advanced level, 1.6 million words. A typical textbook has, the elementary level, has somewhere around 10,000 words. An intermediate level textbook has about 20 to 25,000 words. So you can see here that your textbook is not going to take you very far. So the question then is, how much reading time do the students need to spend? 
And I want you to just think about this for a moment. How much fluent reading, not textbook reading, how much fluent reading do your students do every day? If they're reading two minutes a day, five days a week, how, will they, how long will it take them to learn? If they read five minutes a day or 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day, how long will it take them to learn or to meet 1,600,000 words? The simple math of this is it's going to take them 20.7 years. By the way, I'm seeing in the comments people asking if they have the presentation. Yes, this will be available later. It will be available later. You can have it, please, and please enjoy it later. Okay? Um, 20.7 20, 20 years if two minutes a day, 8.7 for five, and so on. Even if they're reading 20 minutes a day, it's going to take them two years to master this. But, and this is a really important but, this is not uh, enough reading. These maths are based on the fact that uh, a computer has analyzed this and doesn't take into account and the fact that many words have multiple meanings, they also appear in idioms, they appear in uh, phrases, and so on. These are only just the instance of the word. So my guess is you probably need to double, at least double, the amount of reading students need to do to get to this level. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, beginners need to read about an hour a week at their ability level. They will meet unknown words often, so they will learn quickly. These books, the beginning level books, tend to be quite thin, so it doesn't take too long to read the books. For intermediate level students, they also need to read at minimum an hour a week at their ability level on top of their course book. The reason we say an hour a week is this is the sweet spot between how frequently they need to meet words before they are forgotten. If we leave it too long, the words are going to be forgotten. We need to go back to intensive reading. At the intermediate level, the books are thicker and longer. So therefore, although they're doing more, uh, more reading, more actual reading, uh, their reading speed hopefully is imp improved. They're still doing an hour a week at their ability level. Things change for advanced level. When you get to the advanced level, you need to be doing more reading. The reason for that is because you're meeting unknown words less frequently. You need to read more to find things you don't know. Therefore, uh, you need to read two or three hours a week at their ability level. So what's happening is the curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And maybe many of you who've reached the advanced level of English uh, will understand this because uh, you may feel that your English has slowed down, and that's because you already know so much, it takes you longer to find things that you don't know. So the next picture here, I'm going to show you a graphic, and this presentation will be given to you later. But this is something that you can use later to please look at, that if your students are at the elementary level now, and you want to get them to intermediate, it's 169,000 words they need to meet. That equates to about 52 books or about 28 hours. I'm not going to go through this in detail. Please look at this later and you can see where the students are now and where you want them to be. This is the amount of reading material your students need to meet at minimum. Okay. So the next part we're going to be talking about in reading speed. What are the reasons students have to read to learn quickly?
So that gives you a demonstration of how difficult comprehension would be. Many of your students who are reading intensively will be reading at that level. It's very hard for students to remember the beginning of a sentence when they're struggling trying to understand each word. Okay, so reading speed is very, very important. Why build reading speed? I want to explain to you now about how your reading brain changes, how language processing changes as you build reading speed. When you're reading slowly, like you did just now, you're looking at maybe letter by letter by letter, right? You're trying to work out, is this a D or a B? Is that a G or a Y? And so on and so on. When you read faster, as you just did, you can see each of the individual words. So there's a difference here. So here you're reading each word individually, but by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you may have forgotten the beginning of the sentence. This is what we call letter by letter level reading, which is what students are doing at the phonics level. This level is probably the intensive reading level, and the students are focused on the sentences, but often it's difficult, you may not remember everything. But when students read quickly, the processing in the brain changes. We're changing in the way that we process language. When we read quickly, we don't just see words, we see words in groups. Our, instead of our eye moving nine different times, what we do is the eye moves fewer times. We may move only three times. When you read quickly in your language, you're probably sampling words quickly. Why is that? The focus here is on words. The focus here is on ideas. This is an idea unit. This is an idea unit. This is an idea unit. So if I ask you today, if you were talking to someone earlier today about a conversation in some way, in some manner, what were you talking about? You say, oh, we were talking about this, we were talking about that. And if I say to you, what words did your friend say? You can't tell me the exact words, but what you can tell me is your friend's ideas. You can tell me the meaning of the text. So if students are processing language at this level, comprehension goes up, retention goes up, enjoyment goes up because you're processing at the idea level. Now you have more time in working memory to think about why is the old man going to the park? What's he going to be doing? So your brain is not full of language pieces, it's full of ideas. And this is why students enjoy extensive reading because they can get involved in the story, which you can't do if you're focused at this level of um, text. So students like reading. Every student I've ever met loves reading. But what kids don't like is reading something boring. This is one of my favorite cartoons. This is the father talking to the boy. Calvin, your mom and I looked over your report card and we think you could be doing better. But Calvin says, I don't like school. Why not? You like to read. You like to learn. I know you do. I mean, you've read every dinosaur book ever written. And you've learned a lot, right? Reading and learning are fun. Yeah. So why don't you like school or reading? We don't read about dinosaurs. And this tells us a lot about making sure that the children that we're teaching get the right types of materials. It's important that we have the right materials for them. If the reading is too difficult, this is what's going to happen, right? We all know this as teachers, and that's the last thing that we want. We do not want demotivated students. So if the books are too difficult, the learner doesn't understand, therefore they read slowly, therefore they don't enjoy the reading, and they don't read much. This is not going to be good for their reading. When the books are easy, then the students will understand better, they will read faster, they will enjoy their reading, and they read more. So this is the cycle of reading that we need to build. Last time, 
when Alana was talking, she was talking about the e-future uh, graded readers. And these are just a few examples I've taken from the catalog. Um, and so please have a look at these books. There are lots of them available. There's some fantastic stories here for the students to be able to read. And there is a framework here for various levels. These are the CEPA levels, how many words and what levels each of the materials are. Please look at the eFuture catalog and go through that. And you can see that the reading is stepped in certain ways from easy level up to higher levels. So we call them graded readers for a reason. Please remember when we talk about graded readers, we do not talk about grade school, as in oh, my students are in grade three or grade nine. No, that's a different system. Graded here means different. And the way they work is that the easy books are the foundation and we build on previous knowledge in systematic ways. So we start off with easy material at the phonics level, easy vocabulary, easy grammar, moving up to more difficult stuff. And the, <coughs> the final goal is native materials. So we start with phonics, we move up. When the students have mastered this, they move to the next level. When they master this level, they move to the next level. They master this level, we move up systematically over a long period of time until they get to this level. If you start with this material, it's going to be random input. It's not going to be easy for them. Probably demotivating because they can't understand it. So be careful. Make sure that the reading that you give them is systematically programmed so to be where they are. So <clears throat> I'll just go back a slide. Oh, I, I'll go back a slide for a second. So please take a good look at this uh, here. Please take a good look to know what level your students are and what to do. Let's move forward. So how do graded readers work? So the books are specifically written. So the language in unit one and unit two is in here. So this is our, our textbook that's introducing the language. This language and vocabulary is recycled at level one. This is not at level one. This is not at level one. This material, this grammar and vocabulary is in this book and also from this book, yeah? And also we find that this material is in here, right? So what's happening is we're systematically building on previous knowledge, systematically doing it. This is not random input. This is fighting the forgetting curve at all times while giving meaningful, fun practice. So typically, graded readers are like this. Alana didn't talk about them in detail, but this is how they work. The very early levels have very few words, very basic vocabulary, regular sparings, not many words in each book. The next level, the beginner level, has easy vocabulary, has some basic tenses, very simple plot, high visual support, and is slightly longer. The next level material, is longer, now we have paragraphs, harder vocabulary, grammar's a bit more difficult, the plot's a little bit more, fewer pictures, more text, maybe slightly longer. The next level, longer texts, maybe some keywords in there, fewer pictures, maybe there's five or 8,000 words per book. And at the next level, we have very few illustrations and maybe there's complex material a thousand, 10,000 words per book, and so on and so on. The idea here is to build systematically on previous information. So if the students are at a low level, then they need to be starting with phonics and decodable readers. When they've mastered the basics of the language, they need to be moving to intensive material, that is material from your textbooks, where you're teaching them the language, you're teaching them the words, and you're helping them with reading skills. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you need to finish extensive reading before you can start graded reading. Here we start with the very, very easiest level graded readers. Here we have the higher level graded readers and so on. But we need higher level intensive reading books as well. So this might be uh, intensive reading textbook one, textbook two, textbook three, textbook four. And this language is being met again 
in the graded readers and being recycled. Eventually, at some point, the students can try to have, try to challenge the easy native books and then up to the more native books. Notice down here that the input the students have got is much more controlled input here. Down here, there's a lot more student choice. So the idea is to systematically move through these things. You'll need to understand where your students are. Are they here? Are they here? Are they ready for graded reading? Are they not ready? You need to work out where they are on this. Now, it doesn't mean your whole class is at one point. You may find that some of your students are here and they're not able to do graded reading yet. Some other students in the same class may be here and yes, they can do graded reading. So you need to be able to uh, show students how to do that. In my next presentation, we'll be looking a lot more about how to actually implement extensive reading in the classroom. So one of the key levels is trying to find out what level a student would be. The question here is, can the student read something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension so they don't need a dictionary? If the answer is yes, then they are ready for reading that material. If they pick up a storybook and they can R-E-A-D, if they can read it, then that is a book that's ready for them. If they find that the book, the storybook they pick up, maybe it's not so quick, maybe they don't quite understand, maybe they need a dictionary, that storybook is too hard for them, and that's intensive reading. That's okay if they want to do it, but make sure that the students are reading at this level. Now, how do you know? How do you know what a student's level is? You cannot know. It's impossible for the teacher to know what a student's level is because you cannot look inside the head. Only the student knows their own level. So you need to train them well to understand this difference between reading intensively and reading extensively. And you need to train them to ask questions for themselves. Can they read in this way? Now you can maybe observe and you can look at them and watch them. And this is why it's so important in an extensive reading class for you to sit and watch them read. If you see them looking in a dictionary or if you see them using their finger when they read, if they're looking bored and their head is dropping, you know that something too difficult. So you go in and you go and talk to them and say, how's your book? Oh, it's too difficult. Why don't you try this one? Right? So you need to watch them and, and understand how they are reading so they're reading at that sweet spot of fast, fluent, high comprehension. So we're going to talk just a little bit now. We only have about three or four more minutes to find out about extensive reading. How are you going to do this? These are some things that you need to do to start an extensive reading program. You need to find out about it, make a plan, get funding, get people involved, build a library, build a record system, and so on. All of this you only need to do one time, right? It doesn't take that long. We're going to talk a little bit or more about this in the next class. But um, you also need to make decisions about what types of books you get, what books and how many books, which, which students are going to be reading in your level, how much reading to do, how you're going to assess it, how you're going to introduce it, and how you're going to evaluate it. So all of these things you need to think about before you start an extensive reading program. So things I would recommend <clears throat> if you're going to start, this will be to start small. Don't start with your whole school. You're going to make mistakes. You're probably going to get some wrong material. Things are going to go uh, badly from time to time. Anything new is going to go badly from time to time. So start small, one or two classes, maybe just a few of your favorite students privately out of class, show them some books, Make sure you know what level is good for them. Go slowly at first. If you go too quickly, maybe you'll find some pushback from the students, pushback from the parents, pushback from other teachers who are saying, why are you giving them two hours of extra work? You, I can't get, they don't have time for my history classes. So you might get pushback. So anticipate potential problems, ask for advice and help, experiment with ideas, set aims and goals for the students. 
and understand that things don't always go well. I'm going to talk about this in more detail in the next session, but I have a piece of homework for you. If you go to the Extensive Reading Founder Foundation website, there is a guidebook to extensive reading. It's 16 pages long that I wrote some years ago for the Extensive Reading Foundation. It's available in English, also in Korean. It's available in both Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, Cambodian, Khmer, Aram, Amharic, and so on. So your homework before next time, ladies and gentlemen, is please read this. Go to the ER Foundation, download the guide, and build up your knowledge about extensive reading. While you're there, I would also like you to spend some time looking at the Extensive Reading Foundation website. The Extensive Reading Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that, will, that provides guidebooks, articles, uh, bibliography, there's a YouTube channel, an ER toolkit, graded reader list, everything that you need for understanding extensive reading is on this site. We also have some extensive reading affiliate organizations in Japan, Korea, China, Indonesia, Taiwan, Middle East and North America, and we're forming organizations in Vietnam, Thailand, and so on. And we have these on Facebook. Please dig around Facebook. Please join our extensive reading uh, affiliate organizations. And save your money, ladies and gentlemen. Next year in Indonesia, we have the World Congress on Extensive Reading. And it's only extensive reading. This is not about grammar. This is not about language teaching. This is about extensive reading only. And we're expecting somewhere between 800 to 900 people to come only to talk about extensive reading. So, um, Please go to the ER Foundation website. We'll be putting out a call for papers soon. Okay, so that's all I have to say for today. This presentation will be available through eFuture. Next time, I'll be talking about how to develop extensive reading, how to check understanding, how to integrate ER with other skills, and how to assess extensive reading. Um, I would also ask you if you have any questions from today and any questions you want me to answer in the next presentation, Please give your questions to eFuture. I will do my best to answer those questions in the next presentation. Thank you very much for your time today.